All right, we are recording. Okay. So um, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of March 1, 2022 to order at uh, three minutes after nine. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting have been able to do so, should be able to do so, and they and people can join by Zoom or telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted since it is a virtual meeting but every effort is being made to ensure the public will be able to adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. Um, so what I'd like to do quickly to start the meeting is um, just go through to make sure that everybody is connected adequately, can hear and be heard. So, um, well, uh, I'll go uh, in alphabetical order by last name, Lynn Griesmer. Present, and would you like me to put the agenda up when you're done? Uh, yes, you can. Um, that would be helpful. Bob Hegner. I'm here. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Uh, Michelle Miller. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Alicia Walker. Here. Okay, I think that that's everybody accounted for who we expect to be um, available today. We have one member of the committee who indicated that um, he would not be able to be present. Uh, so with that, um, let's go to the agenda and do it. And I'm going to um, quickly um, just uh, go through it just and tell you how I propose to run the meeting um and see if i have any comments on this we have a lot that we're trying to do um i think that uh, uh the two action items are the cpa project and the transportation fund recommendation um, in addition uh, we have two discussion items that are of significance i was assuming that each of them um, if we're going to actually take action, we should try and allocate 30 minutes to them if possible, um, but try and be very conscious of our um, desire to adhere to a two hour time limit um, and allow about 15 minutes each of the two discussion items. Um, one is assessing university and college property and um, the other is water sewer rate policy. And then uh, the rest of the time to make sure that we have time for public comments, um, address uh, um, minutes, questions, and uh, um, do planning for future meetings and any unanticipated business. So that, um, in the, as far as the order is concerned, I was wondering, um, and I'll turn to ask Sean this question too, would it make sense to do the 15 minutes um, uh, that we were going to try and get an overview of the what would be involved with assessing university and college property first so that Kim can get on to other things? Yeah, I think that makes sense as long as um, Dave, Zomek, and Ben are okay with that. I just want to make sure they are all, they're attending for the CPA um, topic. So I just want to make sure that they're okay waiting a little bit. So give them a minute to or a second to okay. raise their hand if they're not okay. Okay, wait a minute. I do have one other. Uh, we do have all members present. Um, so Matt, um, just want to make sure that you're connected and you can. Um, hear us and we can hear you. Good morning, Andy. Yeah, present. Thank you. Okay, so we have all the members of the committee here. Um, good point. Uh, let's try and do the ones that have staff first and uh, 
maybe we'll uh, uh, take the order that. Okay. Well, I do think the assessing one will be probably the quickest. If um, I don't see Dave or Ben saying that they can't wait um, a few minutes. Ben, is that okay with you? Um, yeah, 10, 15 fine. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't, if you're okay with it, Andy, I'm happy to start with Kim. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Kathy actually a question and, and let her start for, uh, because she's the one who requested that this be on the agenda. And um, it would be, uh, it might be helpful if she lays the context of her request to have this on the agenda, just, um, and then uh, we'll turn to our staff to um, provide the information of what would be the um, involved, including costs and costs and staff time and other costs to do it. But uh, Kathy, you wanna? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, there has been a, a long time interest in a piece of legislation that actually didn't go anywhere of, taking a look at the tax exempt properties, particularly of um, where the property has high value. And in this case, it would be our university and our colleges. And it the proposal, and there's still an active proposal, would do the assessed value of the property and then be able to tax it at 25% of the tax of the value. And to do that, you need a valuation of property. So in some of cities like Boston or Northampton, they you needed some benchmark of what the assessed value was or is, um, and uh, trying to get a handle on that is a starting point. What some areas have used, so in Yale, New Haven, and some other parts of the country, that initial look enabled you to say, what amount of money would you be collecting if you had a pilot payment that was uh, more substantial than the current gifts we get um, through negotiation? Um, so it allows you to have a base at which you can at least do a calculation on what amount is foregone. There is a proposal. Um, again, it's, I'm not sure whether it's moving anywhere that would do this across the state, would do a study, would have the, uh, the state work with all the assessors to do an assessment of all property, these non-tax properties above a certain million dollar range and updated every five years. So would be trying to do that across the state. So, so the, this would enable us to at least start to look at this. Um, when I tried to get this information, I couldn't find it. Um, and I initially found Northampton's mayor had used it when she was looking at Smith, um, or he was looking at Smith when it was a he, <laughs> um, and University of Vermont had used it. So it's been this technique. So that's where this came from, Andy, on an interest. And then what I didn't know, Kim, um, was I understand this is not an easy task. So I'm assuming, because this has been a live issue for a while, that, that at the board of assessors level or at a larger collective level, people have said, here is a way of doing it. So rather than every town coming up with, how do I go about doing this? So it wouldn't be a homegrown way of saying um, land value may be easy to price, but the building value, um, you know, what are the alternative, what are the market uses? I understand it's complex. So I wasn't looking to try to find the most expensive, arduous way of doing this. I was looking at, is there a way that others have approached it? Um, what did the, what's happened in Boston? What's happened in a couple of the other Massachusetts communities? I don't know what happened in New Haven. And just so people know, Yale, Yale is now paying multi-million dollars toward the city of New Haven. So we're not talking about, you know, can we get another $50,000 here or there? Um, and University of Vermont did an agreement with the city of Burlington, which is a long-term infrastructure agreement that's in the $12 million range. It's, it's earmarked. You know, they said, we we drive on your roads, we use your schools, whatever it, it, it was. And it, it wasn't done with a, let's just write you a check. It, it took some doing to get it. So that's where this came from, the request. Okay. Uh, 
The one thing that I want to add, and then I want to add, I uh, see that Lynn has her hand up, is that the legislation that you referenced that is pending in the legislature does not apply to the state university. It only applies to private institutions. The way it was, and, uh, Andy, the way I read the newest version, it does, but I'll, I'll get it. The old version definitely did not. Um, it doesn't. The, the, this new one excludes it also, Lynn? That's why I have my hand raised. <laughs> okay, okay, so it excludes UMass? Yeah. Okay, I would have to read it again because I had been told that it would what was being broadened, but I guess not. I mean, I'll trust you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add um, no. in the introduction, Lynn? Yes. Um, so the piece of legislation, so I've been loosely connected to a statewide group that's been looking at pilots and they're the people that sponsored this legislation with a state a uh, state representative from Somerville. And uh, the legislation that they're looking at does have the 25% in, it does not include the publics. And part of the reason the state is reticent to do that is because basically they would have to come up with the money for the publics to pay. The question out there is whether the new bill or the bill that's presently alive um, is at the 25% of property, including buildings and um, uh, land or of endowments. In other words, your wealth. And so in, uh, recently I was asked actually to provide some information about Amherst for this group in a meeting that they had. And I use the integrated post-secondary education database which has figures that of land in terms of, uh, it has figures for land building and endowment. Uh, it's the federal government's um, database that is used to collect all the higher ed data. And in the process, um, again, I, that was readily available and so forth. I also wanna mention that about 20 years ago, Stan Rosenberg did have a study conducted statewide of assessing land. And I have not been able to get a copy, but I think it would be worth getting a copy from the state library and uh, asking them for that because it would be a paper copy. I can't imagine it would be electronic. Um, and that was conducted actually by people at UMass Amherst. So the and my also understanding is that the bill regarding the study is actually died, but the bill regarding the actual pilot at 25% is still, um, has been allowed to go forward from the committee cutoff date, which was February 2nd. So I just wanted to provide those updates. Okay. Thank you. Bernie, did you have anything? And then I want to turn it over to Sean and Kim. Yeah, um, this is this goes <clears throat> round and round and round again. Uh, um, I was involved in considerable discussions with Northampton um, two and three mayors ago um, um, because there's probably a dozen or so communities in Massachusetts who have over in excess of 20% of their property uh, not taxable because of this matter. Um, I know that New Hampshire has some way of managing this. I'm vague on the details. I wish I'd uh, done some homework before we got into this meeting. Uh, the Department of Revenue, whatever they call their Technical Assistance Bureau now, because I know it changed its name, has data on um, how much uh, taxes are potentially lost by Amherst and other communities by uh, non-taxable property. And I, I don't want to give a number because I'd be working from my head and it's not too reliable. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this, is, this is always of interest. Uh, the 25% comes from, I believe, uh, the original going back three Boston mayors, um, pilot program that was proposed in Boston that um, when you subtract out um, everything other than police, fire, and highway, you come up with 25% of, of the taxes. Uh, so that's what gets attributed to the uh, 
to the, the universities and colleges. Uh, Northampton, by the way, went nowhere with its pilot program. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, especially with, when the previous mayor presented his proposal to Smith College, they went meh, and that was the end of that. So good luck with all this, where it'll be an interesting discussion. No, and, so, and Bernie, Bernie, if Department of Revenue um, uh, has, has data, you know, I wasn't looking for you know, spending a lot of money to get the data. So, you know, when I proposed this, it was what is a way to at least know what those numbers might look like? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the UMass definitely knows what its buildings are worth. And I believe there's some assessed valuation of that to begin with. Um, although it may be really difficult for the assessor to there are methods and, uh, and the like. And I, I think it would be helpful to float a, a phone call over to DOR. Uh, and again, I forget the name of the, the Technical Assistance Bureau has not changed its name, uh, but I'm sure they've got that data, um, if not available, they could create it. Andy, is it okay if uh, Kim and I start? Yes. So there's, so just building off this conversation. So there's a couple different pathways. So there's, there's the state owned land pilot program, which we currently get some funding through, but I think everyone generally is unhappy with the way the state owned land is valued and how much we get. And I'll pull up on my screen in a second, um, some information so you can see what that looks like for Amherst. And then there's this separate pilot program, which would be a pilot program between the town and um, nonprofits directly, like what Northampton tried to do. Um, and we've done some initial calculations. We looked at the Northampton model and how they calculated what their estimated pilots were. And we plugged in um, the values of our nonprofits in town, and, and they had some exemptions for um, mental health associations and religious institutions and things like that. So we've done like an initial model, um, but to Kathy's sort of broader point, the, the big issue with our modeling is that the values we have for Amherst College and the values we have for UMass are not, ref we have values, but they're not reflective of what the buildings actually are worth today. Um, they're, they're out of date. So let me share. So on the first pathway there, the state owned land, um, I think our payment this year is about 230,000 that we're getting from the state. And it's really just for the land. It doesn't account for anything, any of the buildings that are on top of that. And let me know if you can see my screen. This is too small. I don't hear anyone saying it is. If is it you too can small? increase it a little bit, it would be helpful. Let me see if it, um, it's not growing for me. Let me try something else. Hold on, I'm gonna make it a little bigger. So this is the calculation for FY23, um, or this is the, the data for the calculation for FY23. Um, so they take a, a, they value our state owned land. And so for what they based on for FY22 is $23 million is the, the value of our state owned land. And I think the most important piece here is the acres so that they have recorded 1,800 acres, um, which is a big chunk of our total acreage in town. And then the part, so I, uh, to Bernie's point, I had a conversation with, um, I, don't, I don't know the technical name either, but from the Bureau of Local um, um, Assessment, uh, a gentleman who helped create this new state-owned uh, land pilot program. And most of my conversation was focused on why our price per acre is so low. Um, if, if anyone could buy an acre of land in Amherst for $12,000, I'm sure they would. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that was most, and, and what it really comes down to is the formula they use is not really reflective of what you would pay today um, or pay in the market for land. Um, so again, I think there's, there's two fronts where if we're, talk, if we're gonna advocate for change, I think one front would be advocating for change on this side with a program that already exists, which is the state-owned land, again, reimbursement program, where we advocate for changes that would better reflect the value um, in Amherst. And then I think the other piece is, is what uh, Lynn was talking about, which is sort of a private pilot program that the, the um, town would use. And then, so I will stop here and turn it over to Kim. And Kim can tell you a little bit about what we've already started doing. So we, um, when I first started, I heard that this was a priority to start um, 
inventorying all of the buildings at UMass in particular. And so it has been started. Um, it, it's, it's a lot for if Kim was just to do it herself. So it, it, some of it comes down to how quickly we want the information. Um, if, if there's a certain timeline, we would have to potentially contract it out. Um, if the horizon's longer, then Kim's office may be able to, to do it over time. But Kim, do you wanna speak to where you're at now? Sure. So um, at the moment, uh, Sean has actually reached out to UMass to see if we could get some of the um, buildings, the, the um, sketches, as well as the cost of the building. So that will help. I mean, ideally, if we could get that, we should be able to do the whole thing relatively quickly. But, um, you know, if, if we don't get that information or if it takes a while to get, you know, that could cost us a little bit more time. Um, and if they are not willing to give, then we would need to uh, actually have someone on the ground measuring each and every building. And as you know, there's a lot of buildings at UMass, so um, that would take some time. Um, the other thing that I would doing when I first started understanding that this was something that needed to be priority um, was looking at our GIS program and actually measuring out each and every building um, based on a UMass map as well as our GIS. And so that was going to save a little bit of time. It wasn't going to be a perfect measurement, but it was going to be better than, um, than what we currently have. So I thought that would be a place to start. Um, so between those two methods, uh, you know, hopefully UMass will come through and be able to give us all that information, um, because when they build a new building, um, you know, it doesn't go through our building department and our planning department, it goes through the state, so we don't always get the plans for the buildings. Um, so I know, specifically looking at the map that I had found on their website, it's, I think it's a, around a 2016 edition of that map maybe a little earlier, but there's certainly some new buildings since then. Um, one in particular I know used to be a parking lot is now, I think, a science building. So, um, you know, the, it, it definitely is going to take us some time to get through these things, but depending on if UMass will get back to us and how quickly, that might help. But um, if we do need to actually hit the ground and start measuring every building, that is going to take some significant time. And and again, depending, like Sean said, on, on our timeline, um, you know, it may cost us some if we need to contract out and have help with that. Um, the other thing is uh, using the GIS like I was starting to do, um, you know, that's going to help us at least get, you know, a rough estimate, a, a better estimate than what we have. But we're also still going to have to go out and actually take pictures of each of the buildings so we know what it is that we're looking at, as well as picking up the new one. So we'll, we will have to do some measure and list on those new buildings. Um, but it also doesn't hurt because we might be able to find some other things like personal property items that maybe we don't have that that would help us, um, you know, collect any our revenue. Kim, um, I see Lynn's hand up but real quick for, um, for Lynn. Can you just talk about the, um, the way you, you would value a building like a like a dorm or a, or a classroom? you know, facility? Sure. So there's different ways to go about it. So um, when speaking with David about this, um, he prior had assessor, mentioned- for people who don't know. Uh, yes, yeah. David, our, our prior assessor, sorry. Um, um, he had suggested that we do an income method on these buildings. Um, the other ways that we can do this is- um, based on like the replacement cost new. So we can look at, at what that value might look like. Um, we can also do, uh, you know, comparisons to other communities, um, the cost approach, the sales approach, the income approach. So we'd really have to um, do a little bit of studying and figuring out what the best method would be to come up with exactly where we wanna be. And I think again, with those methods, um, you know, if UMass can provide us with their cost figures, that's going to help us tremendously. Um, and then we can compare them, you know, considerably compare them to other communities and other colleges of like size to see uh, where their assessments would come in. Thank you. Lynn, and get your hand up. Uh, yeah, let me just mention two things. First of all, Peter Gray Mullen, who is an Amherst resident, uh, is works now for the UMass Building Authority, 
and they would be the people that could help you immensely on this because they oversee all building at UMass across all five campuses and any place else. The other thing is I strongly urge you look at the iPads data and understand how they do it because that is a national uh, formula that all higher ed institutions are used or is applied to all higher ed institutions and would be considered, I think, the generally acceptable way to value land and buildings and uh, so forth. So I, I'm thinking about what Kathy said earlier, and that is, how can we do this without um, spending a lot of money and time? Um, because each of these institutions, pri public and private, have serious inventories. Some of them are insured publicly or through a company, and some like the higher ed institutions, um, public higher ed institutions are self-insured, but somewhere along, and then in addition to that, equipment, for example, in very expensive science buildings will also often be actually insured by a company um, so instead of being self-insured. So there's a lot of, again, I'd start with iPads and understand that. And also then let me mention that there are two, at least two residents in Amherst who understand iPads at a serious level. One of them is happens to be my husband, Brian Harvey, and the other one happens to be Marilyn Blaustein, who ran the uh, Institutional Research Center at UMass Amherst for many, many years. And both again are Amherst residents. Bernie? Uh, those, those are, are, are great suggestions. I was going to um, say if you haven't spoken, and I'm not sure who you contact, uh, maybe uh, our, our rep and senator could be helpful in uh, contacting people within DCAM um, because DCAM is basically the state landlord and they watch all this stuff and have all this information. Um, I say that with some hesitancy because I'm not sure my experience with DCAM is ancient. Um, so, so I would check, check with DCAM. The other private organization that's done a lot of work on pilots is the Lincoln Land Institute. Um, they published a pretty decent book, which is available online as a PDF uh, on, on pilots and maybe uh, floating a call over to the Lincoln Land Institute to see what they've done more recently, what suggestions they have would be helpful and inexpensive. Of course, we have two other institutions, higher education. And, so, and those, what, what did Lynn say? One method might be the endowment. And when you look at the other institutions, that's um, it, it's a meaningful alternative. But in any case, yeah, we do. So, um, so Andy, just to propose next steps, um, Kim and I can can have a conversation with uh, the town manager um, and maybe bring back an update at the next meeting just on on sort of a plan forward on this issue. Um, does that make sense? Um, Kathy, you have thought on that? I, well, I think that makes sense. I just had one quick question on your land chart, Sean, on the acreage. Sure. Is that both the UMass, I think it's, the answer is it's both the UMass land and any state conservation land. Is, yeah, is it, state anything is that's it, owned by. So it wouldn't include Amherst College or. Um, no, but it, it would include the the pieces that are st state. Yeah, so, it's not all. It's not all UMass, right? There's some. There's some other state-owned land components in there. Yeah, no, because I, I know what the UMass acreage is, and it's a bit higher. So I just was quite. Yeah, yeah I think it's. What's in yeah, um, they don't. I don't think they provide that on the website. The detailed breakdown of what's but, in that number, but we could probably get it. Yeah. That's fine. That you answered my question. Thanks. Yeah. What uh, does uh, the DCR land uh, the, in the notch visitors or, uh, the state park that's in Amherst? Is that included? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, Nate Malloy knows quite a bit about it. I don't know if um, Ben or Chris work with this uh, as much, but I know Nate. Um, 
has a way of getting the breakdown, um, he would be the best person to ask that. Okay. Michelle? Yeah, um, I agree with Sean's plan um, to bring back a report, but um, Lynn, I, I wonder how you feel about this being a more comprehensive conversation for the council to have um, with respect to how we approach our anchor institutions, um, you know, whether it be through this program that was outlined today or through private pilots or through um, requesting earmarked funds um, for specific purposes like the school building or other new initiatives um, that the council would like to pursue. And Andy and I have spoken about this a little bit um, with respect to some of the other work that I've been doing. So I'm just wondering if this calls for a more comprehensive conversation to occur with all of the council um, in approaching it more holistically in how we engage and approach these anchor institutions. The town manager's goals, which he just reported on this in his, in his town manager memo last night includes a goal regarding our relationship with higher ed institutions. It includes in that goal, developing a memorandum of agreement with each of them and he reported on the progress of that in the town manager thing. So I think from a standpoint of, has the council already discussed this? At that level, they have. Uh, I think if we start coming up with additional ways in which we want to move forward with regard to pilots, then that can also happen. It, it may not be well known, but the town manager meets weekly with somebody from it, UMass, and they discuss all kinds of things. Um, and the uh, UMass presently pays, I think, Sean, about $120,000 specifically to the schools. Yeah, they pay $185,000 to the schools, and they pay about $400,000 um, for EMS services. Right. So it, there's already one payment, the EMS services for services in kind. The payment for the schools was done specifically because of the uh, North Village, which they're now reconstructing and will be open in this fall. Uh, and that has lots of students that go to our schools in it and it's university owned. And that, was, that came about based on a study that was done by the UMass Donahue Institute. Um, and then finally, I just wanna mention that before I agreed to be on the panel, uh, and collect the data that I did for the panel that was statewide. I did talk with the town manager to make sure that he felt that it was um, politically okay to kind of launch into this in this uh, murky area. And he agreed it was fine. So I, I think at some point when we're ready from the finance committee, because we regularly report, it should come forward. But um, we have a long way to go with discussion, with research and also discussions with the higher ed institutions. And those are open discussions. They're, they're the town managers engaging in those weekly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to follow up quickly. Thank you, Lynn. Um, you know, I did a little bit of research on this and, um, you know, as Kathy said, there are communities all over the country um, that are receiving millions of dollars, particularly from um, private institutions. Uh, and so it seems like this conversation has come around a lot. And um, I, I do, I just want to put on the record that I feel like a more comprehensive discussion with the council about this would be, um, would be appropriate and beneficial. Okay. Yeah, I think. I, just a quick comment. Um, I, I think I, I agree with Lynn that we will bring this forward and our financial guidelines that we put out this year explicitly mention pilots as one way of going. So broader than agreements and some of those millions of dollars in other communities were negotiated um, in a collegial way with first saying what you would pay 
if we taxed you. You know, so it was a, you know, a, a, a public kind of nice way of saying uh, it's time to be a partner with us. Um, you know, so so I think that's where this potentially goes. Um, so it, it's not only one route, but it is a route to getting something more. Paul, uh, I think of it as, I'll use the word power. Um, you don't like to go with your hands out saying, please give me something. You know, you, you want to go to the extent you can with a, let's talk about what we think would make this work for both of us. Um, and so this is partly the evidence that is pulled together by these assessed values, however we do it, helps uh, give some oomph to it. <laughs> so I think where we're at is, so um, the, Sean made a proposal that he and Kim would um, talk with Paul now, report on today's conversation, get his um, feedback from it, and then report back to us at the next meeting so that we can continue the process and the discussion. And um, my other suggestion is that I will do a better job this time of getting the draft done earlier of the uh, committee report of today's meeting. Uh, though it won't be, it's going to be hard to do it for next Monday's meeting, but at least get something in there so that we can start informing the council through the committee report that we've started this discussion because I think the point of making them aware of it is uh, the, the council as a whole um, is a good idea. And that's the way institutionally that we've set it up to do that through council rules. Is that agreeable? Because uh, I don't think we need a motion or anything like that at this stage. We just have a process that we've agreed to by consensus if um, unless somebody objects. Yeah. And I, uh, okay, then let's, um, let's go forward on that basis and uh, try and get on to one thing, uh, the, the next item, which is to try and get to the CPA discussion and see if we have additional information that was requested and uh, can um, address the two proposals that um, are still outstanding for without a recommendation from the committee. Sean, do you wanna? Yeah, thank you. So, um, so I mean, Chris, Ben, and Dave are gonna help with this discussion topic. I'm gonna share my screen just so we can look at something. So the two projects that were not acted on were the Conkey Stevens House for 240,000 and the, the Amherst Women's Club for 135,000. Um, so let me just pull up my notes real quick. So we, uh, we asked the attorney a few questions and then we also had a more extensive conversation among um, uh, the planning staff and, um, and Sonia and I about We've, we do a lot of these types of, pro not these types of projects, but we do a lot of uh, preservation restrictions and things like that. We've had those in the past and how have those worked. And I think we wanted to just bring some clarification back to this committee. Um, just what are the provisions that are in those preservation restrictions? And, and then hopefully that will provide some, um, some added assurance to, the, to this committee that if there is a preservation restriction placed on a property that that carries a lot of weight and there's there's a lot of provisions in that restriction that address some of the some of the concerns of the committee. So we're going to just sort of go through the questions one by one and and sort of uh, add each person maybe we'll add a little bit. So the first question that we addressed was can the town place a condition on the grant that if the property is sold that the CPA money is reimbursed to the town. Um, so our attorney uh, Sharon Everett from KP Law said that we can. Um, we're able to basically, and within the grant agreements for these, um, for CPA projects, you can have certain triggering events that would result in a repayment. Um, I think talking about it more with staff, we feel like the historic preservation restriction is probably more appropriate and more consistent with what we've done with other projects in the past. Um, 
that is a restriction that's placed on the deed and it addresses things like maintenance and um, and just uh, if the building's ever sold and um, things of that nature. So I'll turn it over to Ben probably first to start and just talk a little bit more about how, you know, what's in the restriction, how it protects our investment. Um, and we've got an example too, if people want to see an example of a restriction, mm -hmm. we've got one that I can pull up on the screen just so people can see the different uh, sections that are addressed within a restriction. Maybe I'll do that now. Do you want to go, Ben, while I pull that up? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so a little bit about historic preservation restrictions. Um, they are a binding legal document that um, is filed at the Registry of Deeds. Um, it uh, It's a restriction that runs with the land, I think is important to, to note. So even if it's really on the property itself. Um, so if the building is sold, uh, the restriction is still in place and uh, with the new owner. Um, there's a, you know, a few sections that I think are important to highlight. One is the covenant to maintain. Um, and actually, I'm just going to back up for a second. I think there's another a, a, a question uh, later on about um, kind of the what what comes with the national being being listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which um, the Conkey House is one of seven individually listed properties in Amherst, which is a very uh, important designation. However, one thing to note about the National Register is it's purely an honorary distinction. There's no um, obligation on behalf of the property owner to maintain the property to uh, you know keep it in its historical condition really it's a it's an honorary designation like I said and something that really kicks in when there's federal or state funds at play um, however with local funds uh, national register doesn't um, come into play so it kind of adds to the importance of a preservation restriction which is um, what we're looking at now, uh, which does require, um, and it's a legally binding uh, document, which requires maintenance to the property. And you can see it here in the bottom, or sorry, in the fourth to the bottom line, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the treatment, um, sorry, on, the, on paragraph 4.1 at the bottom there, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Property. So that's essentially a, a set of guidelines put forth by the Secretary of Interior's office on how historic properties should be maintained uh, with the highest integrity uh, for, from an ar architectural standpoint. Um, and then there's also kind of this list of properties that can be um, permi uh, permitted without any review, such as ongoing maintenance and and, and, and that kind of um, activities. And then there's a set of activities that um, require review by the, in this case, it would be by the Historical Commission. Um, so I think actually, uh, Sean, if you go to the very end, there should be a list of minor and major activities. Typically it's at the, in the end of the appendix. Yeah, here, there it is, yeah. So there's a list of these uh, types of um, activities that require uh, review. The major activities would require review by the Historical Commission and, and their approval. Um, and so that's a way to ensure that any kind of exterior changes to the building are being done with the uh, utmost architectural integrity to res respect the uh, historic um, nature of the buildings. And, and then certainly there's just, uh, it's a le legally a binding document that they can't, um, you know, demolish the building certainly. Um, and kind of just that these major exterior changes need review and approval by the historical commission. So, so what you're just to build on what Ben's describing, what you're looking at is an example of one, this one's from, we've got some that are in progress or some that we've had in the past, but we didn't want to drag up old um, yeah. old debates in this town. So we gave you an example of, a, of one from another uh, community, but this, the sections are, are pretty mm -hmm. consistent, right, Ben? Um, yeah. So, so this one is from the city of Salem. But so so I guess I think the, what we wanted, the point of this was to say that if the, the concern of the committee is protecting the investment of CPA funds, 
we feel the restriction can protect the investment of CPA funds in terms of maintaining whatever improvements are made, that those improvements will live on. Um, the, I think the second piece, Ben, did you want to say anything else before I was going to turn it over to Dave? No, yeah, I was just okay. going to add that this restriction is kind of the template that uh, the Mass Historic Commission sends out to communities to, to base their restrictions off of. So that's where it came from. So I think the, the second piece we wanted just to weigh in on, weigh in on is um, sort of the, the importance of, of privately owned historic property in town. And Dave was going to speak to that a little bit. Um, this past year in particular, the CPA committee did a lot of outreach, encouraging um, sort of private proposals for CPA. Um, ben, I think you even mentioned that, you know, that's the historic uh, commission actually did some outreach to, to different parties because of that message that the, the Community Preservation Act Committee um, gave. And so some of these projects are in response to that sort of outreach effort. Um, and so I guess, Dave, do you want to just weigh in on, on what we were talking about? Sure. Thanks, Sean. I'll be very brief. And I think um, thanks to Ben for, for kind of you know, pointing out a number of those um, those those elements of of the restrictions themselves, but you know, very briefly, you know, staff had a conversation about you know really the importance of these historic structures, and 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 I use the word kind of fabric of our community as we look at some of the historic districts in town, and and Ben talked about uh, being on the National Historic Register that there are a number of these, you know, and, and in Amherst, Ben referenced the number seven, seven, seven um, structures that are on the, the National Historic Register. But more importantly, these are structures that we all walk by, we bike by, we drive by. They're part of the fabric of what makes Amherst, you know, so unique and 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 really take us back in time. And I, and I guess in our conversations with staff, I, I made an analogy really and to, to the importance of farmland. And so I, I look at these historic preservation restrictions in a very similar way to, to, I, to the way I look at APRs, agricultural preservation restrictions, that the farmland that makes up Amherst is part of our agricultural history. And I think a word that, that comes to mind often is that these, these restrictions uh, are in perpetuity. So they're, they're designed to be forever. So I think that's really important that the public benefit, the CPA investment, those dollars that the public uh, is, is um, really uh, making available for us to use are protecting this resource for us and more importantly, for future generations in perpetuity. So that's the way I, I look at, um, at these historic uh, preservation restrictions. I actually went by and, and uh, spent a little time this weekend uh, near the Conkey House and just looked at you know, the building and, and the, various, um, the various generations of structures there and, and was kind of sitting uh, in the parking lot over the weekend just uh, thinking about how long that building has been there and the importance of it. So I think that's what we wanted to kind of share as staff is that these are in perpetuity, their investment for us, but for future generations uh, to enjoy this building and enjoy the history of, of what those buildings have meant to our community. So I think I'll stop there and, and we can move on to other, other uh, questions that uh, the committee raised. Chris, did you wanna add? I just wanted to say that I think that they're also um, an element in our economic development. Um, people come to Amherst to see these historic buildings. When they go and view the Conkey House, they may stop in at the Black Sheep or they may have lunch at Oriental Flavor and then they go to the bookstore or Hastings. And, you know, these buildings bring people to Amherst, whether they're staying in Amherst or just driving through on their way to the Berkshires or whatever. But I think that they're a, an important element in our um, economic development and that we really need to um, preserve them. Thanks. And just to add to that, Chris, and, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the way it stands now, there's nothing that requires the owners to maintain the historical elements of the house. Um, with this investment of funds and the deed restriction, there would be something that would main, require that. Um, so I think that's just something to keep in mind as well. So the second question that we received was, can the town place a condition on the grant requiring that the property will be maintained to continue to meet standards required for continued inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places 
um, or as required by the Historic District Commission. So I think Ben already stated that I don't think there are sort of maintenance standards that are currently required. Um, however, if we do have the if we did have the historic preservation restriction, there would be um, sort of a required maintenance element as part of that restriction. The third question was, can the town structure a CPA award as a loan to be repaid by the owner um, or for a condominium assessed to owners for a share? So we, we asked this uh, to our legal counsel as well. Um, they confirmed it could be structured, the grant could be structured as a loan. Um, Sonia and I in particular have some concerns about sort of starting that pro, uh, precedent of loaning out CPA funds and how that process would work and, um, and you know, how, how we're going to collect this over so many years and things of that nature. So um, if this is an option, the committee just wants us to pursue further. I think Sonia and I would want to do a lot more research on how this works in other communities because we haven't done it here. Um, Christine? I think you'd have a hard time combining the historic preservation restriction with the idea of a loan, mm -hmm. because the historic preservation restriction is in perpetuity. And right. why would someone want to um, put a restriction on a building in perpetuity if he knew he had to pay back the loan? Right. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Right. You might lose that element of it. Right. Um, and then the fourth question, um, really the last question is, can the town on its own decide that we will only fund personal historically designated property to a certain level? And if so, what would this measure look like? So we also talked to legal counsel about this. Um, I think the first thing to, to note is the council has final say on all this. They vote the appropriation and they could always reduce the appropriation um, you know, more or less by the amount of the projects it doesn't want to support. So the council does have final say on all this. Um, in terms of an official action by the council, that would be sort of preemptive where you would say CPA coalition, we only want you to recommend projects up to a certain level. Um, legal counsel said you could do that as sort of a non-binding guideline or sort of an, um, advisory, but it would not be binding um, because there is a certain authority given to CPA committees and you uh, the council can't sort of over, you know, usurp that authority. So the council could issue kind of guidelines that were non-binding if it wanted to, um, but it, our attorney didn't think that there could be any binding action um, to do that. And I think this, this one also, when staff spoke about this, again, it also gave us a little bit of a pause about the outreach efforts that the CPA committee has taken this year to encourage proposals. And then if there was sort of a, you know, further restrictions on those proposals that might counteract a little bit of what they were doing or making it make it a little more um, complicated when they do outreach about we want, you know, we don't want all proposals, we want these types of proposals or something like that. Um, so just to keep that in mind as well. And then the last question was sort of straightforward. So can the attorney help us with this process if the council decides to move forward with anything here and, and our council is always happy to support the town um, if there's additional questions or, or needs. So I guess that's what we wanted to report back and see if there's any additional questions, if there's any um, additional concerns or elements that we didn't address. I don't know, can anyone hear me? Uh, I'm not sure, I just wanna make sure that I'm connected. Um, and I have to tell you about my limitation is then. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I, for some reason, my computer will not reconnect to the, some actually on my cell phone. The problem with cell phone is it's very limited in what I can see. And uh, I, uh, therefore, I think I'm going to have to request that either Kathy or Lynn continue to chair the meeting so that we can keep it moving. I, I can chair it, Andy. I can. Um, I saw the order that the hands went up, so I can call on people. So I, I think Lynn was the first hand up. Lynn. Yeah. Um, could you provide us a list of the seven properties, including uh, their status in terms of public occupancy, uh, our ability for the public to have access? and uh, maybe some, some additional information like value. Have we ever given those properties anything else? Um, that's number one. 
Um, and let me just say behind this for me is an issue of, do we have access to the, uh, to the building as the public? For example, um, we have provided CPA money to Hope Church and we can go to Hope Church and we can look at it. Um, we've done the same thing to JCA. We can go there, we can look at it, we, go, we can go inside. Same thing is true for the women's club. Um, but if it's a private property that's condoized, you know, I happen to have a business in that building that is no longer there that I did business with, but it's been a long time and I was only there because I was there for the business. So part of me, I understand that CPA money is really only for the external part of the building and what we're trying to preserve is the look, but then there's, there's for me, the bottom line is this is taxpayer money. And what do we feel we owe or should do? So I, I'm still very much thinking about this and it's uh, created a serious level of consternation for me about people buying historic homes and then coming to the public and saying, can you help me repair my home? So, thanks. Michelle. Yeah, um, I really appreciate what Dave said about these properties being the fabric of our community. And I, I appreciate also what Chris said about them bringing economic stim you know, stimulation. I, I agree with those those statements. Um, and I like the idea of a historic preservation restriction. My question is, um, in some sense, this may sort of um, perpetuate like a repeated application by the particular, um, in this case, the Conkey home. They may come back because now they're, you know, <clears throat> bound by these um, restrictions. Um, so is there a way to attach a fund reserve that they would be required to keep um, to the restriction so that we can be assured that they are also taking some measures to, in this case, collect from the condo owners and build a reserve to properly maintain the property? Um, I, I don't know, Ben or Dave, if you have seen anything like that in any of the prior agreements that you've worked on. Um, I think we can require them to maintain it. If we wanted to talk about the mechanism, the mechanism for which they maintain it, we might be able to put something like that in a grant agreement. Um, in terms of future requests, it's always going to be up to the CPA committee whether they would want to entertain future requests and, um, and Sonia will uh, kill me if I don't say that, like routine maintenance is not eligible for CPA, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be to preserve the historic elements. Any routine maintenance would not be eligible. Um, so, but we can look into that about whether, you know, we can include the mechanics, you know, or sort of explicitly say like, you know, we expect you to take care of this the next time it comes up or something like that. Um, yeah, we can, we can look into that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking about it now from the perspective of the condo is more in my experience with condos, they have several lines of reserves. Um, <laughs> so maybe this wouldn't apply to all um, historical properties, but in this particular property where there are condo owners that are paying in and there, that's pretty standard to have those line items um, for different types of reserves, it may be possible. Okay. And Ben, you may remember this from working with this group, they do have a capital sort of fund and I believe they're they're making other improvements, aren't they? Are they planning to save up for other improvements to the building? Yeah, certainly they have a, uh, an assessment that they on uh, condo owners, both the uh, residential uh, properties at the Salem Place condos and the uh, office condos within the Conkey house. Um, it's all pooled into one fund for ongoing maintenance and capital improvements. Um, this CPA request uh, was preceded by, uh, I don't, I don't want to quote the exact numbers, but it was quite a large investment in the, uh, in the slate roof for the Conkey house uh, to really shore up the, the, the weatherproofing uh, for the roof. So they have uh, 
you know um, invested quite a bit in the in the Conkey house over the past years um, and they do have the ability to kind of have have ongoing uh, you know funds from the assessment for maintenance. Bob? Yeah, I, I had two questions. Um, the, the first question has to do with uh, the maintenance requirement. And it, I only had a chance to look at it very briefly, and I'm not an attorney. But um, it, it seemed to me that it was unclear whether, um, for example, if we were to use CPA money to fix a roof, whether the maintenance requirement then extends to the entire structure or only, only refers to the roof. Uh, that's the first question I have. And the second question I have is what happens in the case of bankruptcy? Um, what do we do with a property where the owner goes bankrupt and can't maintain it or do anything with it other than sell it? So we will post the um, we'll post that restriction to the packet so people can if they want to go back and read it in more detail. We were going to do it ahead of time. It was my fault for not getting in there. Um, so we'll post that to the packet, and we'll also post some of the background information on the the Conkey Stevens house and the um, and the the women's club, so you can see just some of the history of it. Um, and we will talk more with Sharon about the what happens in the case of a, a bankruptcy. Does that change anything with the restriction? Again, if, if the property changes hands, we know that the restriction goes with it. Um, but just if there's any anything else we should be aware of. So um, I see both Dave's hand and Chris's hand went up. Are you both speaking to what was just asked? Yeah, Dave. Sure. I think there were two questions there from Bob, um, and maybe Ben or Chris could could address the the roof related maintenance issue in a minute. But I just, you know, I, I'm very confident on the on the bankruptcy issue. I mean, I, I we can get that information from Sharon Everett at Copeman and Page, but I, I really think the the historic preservation restriction runs with the deed so it regardless of who owns it it does not go away it is it is analogous to a, a, an apr so it runs with the deed whoever the future owner is would be bound by that historic preservation restriction um i don't think there's any way to lift that i think it would take a an act of the town council and also uh, an act of the state legislature to remove that historic preservation restriction, but we can get more detail on that. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I, this is a great conversation. I understand the concerns about this being a private um, property, if you will. And, and I heard your comments or your concerns earlier, Lynn. Um, but I also want to put out there that you know, in my experience, um, there really are no guarantees about future ownership of land or buildings. And, you know, I, I even want to put it out there that we've funded, we've, we funded the JCA, we funded a historic preservation restriction of the Jones Library, we funded a historic preservation of restriction of the uh, UU of the uh, historic stained glass window. But these structures, it does feel it's, there's something it feels a little better when we're funding an organization, a nonprofit. But I just want to put it out there that nonprofits come and go. There is no guarantee that the women's club will be the owner of that building in perpetuity. Just like there's no guarantee that the JCA will own that historic church uh, down on Main Street in perpetuity. But the but the preservation restriction preservation restriction will live on. In my experience, almost 20 years working for the town, it has been very hard to, to get private owners of historic structures in Amherst to come forward and do, do these projects with us um, because of the uh, concerns about putting a, a deed restriction, a historic preservation restriction on their deed. Um, and, and I have to say that also, in my experience, there's no other sources of money out there to protect these historic homes. 
You know, uh, I've been in so many meetings where people say there must be federal money, there must be state money. In my experience, there really isn't. CPA dollars, you know, and this is true across the state, communities use CPA dollars to preserve these, um, these, these private homes. Um, and, and again, Lynn, you asked the question about access. And I think there's a way we could structure the historic preservation restriction so that if the owners were willing, um, again, this is a business, the, the condos in that, in that structure are open, say nine to five, Monday through Friday, we could put some reference to that in the historic preservation restriction that if any of us or in the future, people wanted to go in and view the in, internal structure of the building, they could, um, whether they're visiting one of those uh, businesses or not. But primarily the, the, the historic preservation restriction gets us access to the outside features of the building, which are what we are preserving. Um, but I think there's a way to get that, Lynn, uh, just like the JCA or the UU have to provide, you know, if somebody wants to go in and see the beautiful historic structures, they can during business hours of that organization, uh, organization A or B or C. So I think there's a way to get access to the building and we could negotiate that with the, the owners of the, uh, of, the, of the condo association or the condo, individual condo association owners. So anyway, just wanted to put out a couple of those comments. Chris, are you, are you still speaking to this as well? And I wanted to speak to another of Bob's questions. And the okay. question was, um, if, the, uh, if an entity receives money to fix its roof, does the historical preservation restriction only apply to the roof? And no, it applies to the whole building, the whole historic portion of the building. So if there's a portion of that building that was built in the 70s, it probably wouldn't apply to that portion. But the historical portion of the building, the whole thing would be covered by the historical preservation restriction. Thank you. Um, Bernie. It just, um, because we're, this has provided an opportunity, I think, to talk about this process as a whole and that um, any concerns about these two specific properties here, but I would just suggest that in the future, uh, when the CPA comes forward with a proposal for um, funding a private piece of property, that the proposed deed restriction be part of that recommendation or be available at the time along with a statement of how it's intended to be enforced so that these questions are resolved in advance. That's all. So I'm gonna call on myself um, and, and then I'll call on Bob again. Um, I think differently about the two properties. So I think the reason we're focusing on Conke Stevens um, is what Lynn was remarking on that uh, the the women's club we do have access to, it is a public resource. I mean, you, you have to pay for events when there, but there are lectures and there are other things. So it's the, the larger public use. So my, one of my questions is um, with the yes, we could, uh, the attorney said we can get uh, uh, money paid back. What I, my concern is that we are potentially enhancing the value of the property and then it could be sold and the current owners of it, and I realize it's a condo association would reap that. So could we do a combination of the payback, should it be sold and historic preservation? Because the two seem to me to work well together. Um, the historic preservation is an obligation to continue um, to preserve this. The other is uh, uh, saying uh, that, I don't think anyone, especially it's so complicated, the ownership on it, there are lots of condos in here. Um, it's not just one or two. So it's more likely pieces of it would be sold over time. So I'm not even sure how the payback works. But my concern is really on the private ownership and the potential to have the value of the property be enhanced with public money without public access. So this one, I differentiate from the other quite a bit. Um, and I will stop there. You know, I, I think Bernie, absolutely that we should be sending this forward, but I think this is, is a, not a good long-term use when, even if it's not this year, because no other proposals came up, 
It's competing for CPA dollars that could have gone for affordable housing. Um, some broader uh, it, it, recreation land improvements or high school track. It's not, I'm not looking at this in isolation. It just, it wasn't competing in this queue, but, but those monies can be reserved and used for other purposes. So I think of this as tax dollars just through another route and I will stop there. Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment that the, the questions I had, uh, please don't misinterpret them as uh, questions about the value of historic preservation. If you look over my shoulder on the picture, that's a bridge in Switzerland, that a footbridge that dates back to the 15th century and is still in use today and has paintings from the early 1600s inside it. So I, I, I definitely appreciate the value of historic preservation. With Kathy and Lynn, I'm just questioning what, where, how do we put public money in to specific structures? So Bernie's hand is back up as is Chris's. Um, so Bernie, is it new topic, Chris? Con it, it, well, anyway, I'll just first Bernie, then Chris. Very, very quick response. I don't discriminate between the Women's Club and the uh, Condo Association. They're both private entities. They're not public entities. Um, and we are do making capital improvements in both those structures. So um, I, I just, uh, and I, I do agree with you that these uh, compete with compete with other demands um, out of the out of the CPA money. Although we do have some, um, you know, we do have a, a I believe we have a restriction. We have to spend ten percent of it on uh, on these matters. So uh, uh, again, I'm not cutting the one uh, applicant any slack over the other. They're both corporations that are not that are private corporations that hold these properties that we're making a capital improvement in. Chris. So I just wanted to note two things. And one is that um, I think that rather than enhancing the value of the property, the CPA funds would really be preserving the value of the property because they're not adding a wing or, you know, some fancy you know, thing that isn't there already. They're just taking what's there already and trying to preserve it and make sure that it doesn't leak or fall apart or whatever. So I think preservation rather than enhancement is the way I would look at it. The other thing I wanted to note is that in the past, it's interesting to me that we're having this conversation now about funding public properties versus private properties, because in the past, people have argued against using CPA funds to fund um, public buildings like, you know, repairing the town hall, for instance, or something like that. They say, well, you know, you really should use public uh, tax money to maintain the public buildings. You shouldn't use CPA money. So that's, that's an argument that I've heard in the past, whether it was at town meeting or where it was, I don't remember. But there's always this kind of push-pull between funding public and private. And I think that in our town, both public and private buildings are important to maintain because they bring people to town. That's all, thanks. Uh, Lynn and then Sean. Um, Chris, I, I, under, I totally remember those arguments going back to the preservation of town hall and the renovation of town hall, which was more inside, but the preservation outside. Um, but I am going to disagree with you as a former treasurer of a condo association. Uh, it clearly helps the value of sale if people know the, the association has kept the property in good repair. And it would, it would be individual property owners from the condo association that when they sell, they benefit from that. I, I do differentiate between the two. And I you know, and I am not against historic preservation. I am just trying to figure out how we as a town have to balance this against things like needing a new field for uh, recreation, which is not out of the same percentage. So, um, but that's it. Thank you. 
Sean. Yeah, so I guess I just wanted to talk about two things. So next steps and what information does this committee need to either make or, or not make a recommendation on these two projects? So Lynn, do, do, is there a date set for the hearing the on these projects? The public forum, which public is forum. required, uh, is tentatively set for the 21st of March. Okay. We have not advertised it yet. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it. Um, the, the goal in the past has been to try to do CPA as early as we can so the people who will be getting CPA monies know that as early as they can. All right. So, so the actions this committee can take is to either recommend these projects or recommend against these projects, um, or I suppose abstain in its um, action on these projects. We Yes, we can decide not to act on these projects, but at some point we need to go one way or the other. Right. And so I think, I mean, my point is in an, an ideal world, we would make a decision on these projects so that all the projects can be considered at that public forum. Um, and whether the vote is a for or against or uh, again abstaining um, that they be considered with the other slate of projects um, and so again that just brings me to is there, are there i've got some notes down about additional pieces of information but it, it really seems like it's sort of a philosophical discussion at this point um, not a, a something the attorney is going to help us with about whether these types of projects the finance committee wants to support or not support um, and I think we're not, you know, Sonia and I aren't weighing in. I'm not sure about planning, but um, we just want to get you whatever information you need to to act on these. So, Andy, okay. should I turn it back to you? Do you want to go back to chairing? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, finally I got my computer working again. So I'm, uh, I had to actually go through a whole restart process in order to get it to come back. Windows is wonderful, isn't it? Um, the, uh, you know, I have been listening to the conversation and it's been very good conversation. I think that the public private discussion is probably not worth pursuing too much because you could go down that path forever. Um, I've always viewed CPA funds as public funds. It's just a different form of public funds. Um, their question um, still was, is, hangs out in my mind at various times about some of these proposals is when the anti-aid amendment comes in and uh, creates problems. Uh, but uh, I think that that's also a difficult question that we did not really delve into. Uh, with, Andy, I think, uh, I think that's been addressed. I mean, with the, we've had other projects like that, like with the steeple and with um, the stained glass windows. I think the, the general opinion is if it, the, the benefit to the public is the view, um, that's sort of what I've heard. And so that, that's the public benefit. And so as long as there is a public benefit, um, I don't think this project would be unique to some of these other projects that we've done. Well, we, then we get into the distinction between publicly owned and uh, by uh, individuals or a nonprofit and whether that creates a distinction because this, I'm not sure that we've done one where it's privately owned as opposed to uh, by individuals as opposed to a nonprofit. Right. So that would be the only distinction. Though the history of the anti-aid amendment suggests that uh, it's not a valid uh, distinction. Uh, I do think we need to um, come forward with a recommendation to the council or not, but um, I would hope that we can. The uh, statute has the uh, recommendations made by the Community Preservation Act Committee reports to the council, the council asks the opinion of its committees, but actually the uh, referral from the CPA committee is to the council itself. And therefore uh, we need it, it ultimately this question belongs to the council. Um, I see several hands up and I don't know, Kathy, where we were with that, but I, um, as far as order is concerned, 
I hope that um, somebody um, is now getting to the point of suggesting a resolution and uh, that that we can uh, consider. Um, so, so Lynn's hand came up first, but Matt hasn't spoken yet. And right. okay, why don't we take Matt then? Thanks, Kathy, Andy, and I'll be brief. Um, I think the main thing I want to say about both these discussions is uh, my gratitude for Dave and Sean and the town staff in terms of doing the background research and just giving us uh, all this information. You know, it's complicated as somebody's coming in new. Uh, it's a lot of complicated and, and historical information to gather. So I appreciate it. And I, I really appreciate the perspective of, you know, what is the intent of the CPA? Um, and kind of reflecting what Andy just said, I, I do think that, you know, uh, Chris and the, and the CPA are, you know, they're public servants as well, and they're entrusted with, with these recommendations. And I think a lot of these concerns about public private um, are, you know, that's kind of baked into the, the underlying statute for this. Um, and, and I think we have to trust and expect that the CPA is, is making those, those, that balance, weighing, weighing these things on balance and, um, you know, looking for immediate urgent, you know, public needs, uh, as well as historical preservation, as well as um, public housing. So, you know, to Andy's point, I, I think that the CPA's recommendation to the council um, does take some of these things into account. And, and I think we've exceeded some of the public uh, expenditures overall in terms of uh, amount into affordable housing and, and such. Um, so I would, I, I'm in support of, of the proposal as, as made. And I think, you know, if we want to look more broadly at the overall 3%, you know, um, uh, tariff that goes in or 3% that, that goes into um, the CPA funding. I, I think that's a much bigger conversation than this particular slate of, of projects. So I, I do support the, the slate of projects as written and I, I really appreciate the thought that's gone into it. Ernie? Um, um, yeah, I, I think just to, to two comments. One, um, Senator Warren, that is withstanding we pay a wealth tax that's on property and the CPA is wealth tax. So it's all tax money for one. And for two, I, my understanding is the NTA um, amendments requirements are met through the deed restriction. So as I said before, put the deed restriction up front along with the proposal so those questions of, about how the public purpose is going to be met and protected are answered. Thanks. Lynn? Please take Alicia next. Okay. She hasn't spoken. Alicia? Um, thank you. So I'm just, I'm listening to everyone's feedback and trying to develop my own opinion on this. And I just have a question um, because I've never worked with CPA funds before about how they work. Um, and so if we were not to adopt these recommendations, then what happens to the funding? So, um, Sonia, do you want to weigh in on what happens if the if these projects aren't approved and the funding going back to the CPA? Well, um, we're obligated to approve at least 10% for each category, historic preservation, community housing, or open space and recreation, which, which are combined. So we have to at least set aside 10% for each of those. If we were not to recommend any projects, we'd put 10% into reserved fund balances for that and the rest would be in the undesignated fund balance for future appropriations. But um, if you're talking about just removing these two projects, we would have to we would have to go back to CPA and CPA would have to recommend uh, approximately $43,000 to go into a historic preservation reserve because we wouldn't meet our 10% this year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So just adding to what Sonia said, um, the CPA committee could reconsider um, uh, ways to spend that money they could put into the reserve, but at least a certain amount will have to go towards the sort of preservation projects um, to meet that 10%. And it, and I guess the other point is the, the notion of reserve, it carries over to the next year if they don't spend right. it. So this, the, it's not a 
spend it, use it or lose it situation. Right. I mean, it's reserved for a particular designated purpose. Um, and so it means there's, if another, they actually can, my understanding from listening to the committee is if a project came along in the spring, they don't have to make a decision just once a year. They have done it that, that way. So, um, but this could be part of next year's funding base. So it can go in both directions. As long, can I just add to that? As long as there is a reserve to, because once the tax rate is set, you're no longer budgeting on estimated receipts. So it has to be money that's in, in the account some way or other. Um, first of all, I want to just thank the staff for the enormous amount of research that's gone into this because I think you even opened up additional issues such as whether or not we want to do um, preservation uh, restrictions. And I think, Bernie, you're absolutely correct. That needs to be known upfront that that's part of the deal. Uh, you can't say to somebody after the fact, oh, and by the way, if you accept this, now we're going to do this to your property. You need to say it up front. Um, so it seems to me that there are several questions that will go forward to the council. That's one of them, whether or not we want to do that kind of deed restriction. The second one that I think has to go forward to the council is the fact that we have approved all of the other projects. And so we're ready for a conversation on that. The one that's still out there is what and how much we want to do. And uh, with regard to these two particular projects, and there's nothing that stops the council from having a public forum and hearing from other counselors and then having the finance committee reconvene and take a vote on those last two projects. And in some ways, I actually am suggesting that that's what we do. Okay, so I think that there are three possibilities if I've got it right. One is what Lynn just suggested, which is to not make a recommendation, but report on this and then suggest that it come back to the, uh, the these two projects come back to the committee, or of course the council could just decide to vote. A second one is that, uh, we go ahead and make the recommendation as it is. And the third is that um, even though it was not known to the applicants at the time that they put it, they're still very much wanting the money and to go with the, um, say that we would suggest uh, approving the grants subject to an agreement from the applicant, at least in the um, uh, either one or both applicants actually, uh, which is a separate discussion um, that um, in the start, the, that there be some kind of historic preservation restriction that we would add. Um, so Dave Zomek, Sure, I, I don't mean to disrupt where you're going. I know you want to move toward a vote, Andy. I'm a little confused. Is there some question that either one of the applicants didn't know that they would have to put on a historic preservation restriction? That's always part of our discussion with applicants. So there's no, there's no confusion. We always, that is a requirement of the law. So anybody who applies is told that. So so I just wanted to put that out there that there should be no surprise on the part of either one of these applicants that they would have to put that on there. To Bernie's question about putting, I'm not exactly sure what you meant, Bernie, by putting that out front in the broader discussion, maybe we always assume it as staff because we live this every day. We can't put the actual document that we would use for the Conkey House or the, um, or the Women's Club out there in the packet, we can put a, a boilerplate draft because that would still need to be negotiated between the parties. So we would not spend all that time, energy and legal counsel's time negotiating that if the council 
doesn't fund the project. If you, do you follow me on that? So we could put out a draft. There's, there's a boilerplate that we use for most of these and they're specific to a particular property or building or structure. But again, we wouldn't take it down that path and get to the, the finish line of a historic preservation restriction before the funding is authorized. And I like to, I think, Andy, where you were going is you would, you know, they're, they're, the council could take a vote and say contingent upon a, a finalized historic preservation restriction. So I just wanted to put those two points out there that that the applicants always know that it's a requirement to put on a, a preservation restriction. And two, we wouldn't put out a we wouldn't work on a draft with them prior to knowing whether they're going to get funded because it, it's just not a good use of staff time or legal time. Thanks. Well, that's helpful. Bernie, did you have a response as uh, was part of the Yeah, I, I'm I'm aware that the the requirement that there's a requirement about um, you know, notifying an applicant around a historic re preservation restriction or the, the requirements of the anti eight amendment. Um, I, you know, I can I can accept uh, Dave's point that uh, uh, you, you know that, and and I think the uh, the notion of of saying that um, uh, you know this would be uh, uh, proved pending a suitable. Uh, Deep restriction. It, it, that's that's a good compromise. Um, I, I don't want to get into arguing whether or not you know negotiating this up front because it, it, there's probably some discussion that goes on up front about what we what we do or what what a boilerplate historic re, uh, preservation restriction looks like. But I think when when I said up front, what I meant is when the CPA committee goes ahead and recommends to the council that um, the um, um, the uh, uh, project go forward, that the, the whole, some detail, whether it's a boilerplate or not, uh, of the, uh, the preservation restriction is part of that proposal. So that everybody knows up front that there's gonna be a deed restriction and it will more or less meet these this framework uh, and that there will be a final vote uh, when the deed restriction is, um, is completed. Uh, to approve the project, so that the town knows, people know that their uh, their their funds are being uh, and the property is being protected. Uh, you know, I used to work next to I, my my office in Springfield was right next door to Mulberry Street, and I unfortunately remember Dr. Seuss's house going away, uh, which was supposedly a preserved historic property. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, uh, you know the current applicants are in, anywhere near doing something like that. But I think we need to have some protection here uh, for going, going forward. And that's one way to do it. So I think Dave's suggestion is a good one. I, I think it'd be a good compromise. Hey, uh, Chris, do you have anything you wanted to add from the staff perspective from planning? Um, just a quick comment that sometimes these deed restrictions take a long time. Sometimes they need to be approved by the Mass Historical Commission. Um, they can actually take years to be put in place. So to hold back the money um, until the deed restriction is signed and filed at the registry, recorded at the registry, may be um, kind of a bridge too far as far as I'm thinking. Um, but the idea of having a draft uh, when, um, when the money is approved, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm just cautioning you against withholding the money until the thing is actually recorded at the registry, because that could take a long time. Uh, Kathy? Um, I just wanted to, um, Annie, I know you were trying to get to closure on what are we gonna do for next steps. Um, I'd like our report in terms of recommendations to reflect uh, that the bulk of the, Except for these two, we are recommending approval. Um, we had a good discussion. And then on these two, uh, talk about the discussion we had, the issues that were raised. Um, you know, we don't have to right now come to uh, a yes or a no, but issues on the deed restriction, on repayment, um, some of these other issues, because I think it's important that the rest of the council have the benefit of what we've heard 
rather than um, wait for public comments on this. And so I think that section should flag why, and including the comments by staff on, you know, the, the value of having well-preserved, fabulous historic houses as we drive down the street in Amherst, that it's an asset that's a public asset. I think we should be it should be a rich report on this section, but also the questions about competing needs um, and the fact that this is a privately owned condo association. I think I never would have flagged this if that hadn't been true. Um, and uh, listening to the presentation initially at CPA, this one, because I'm the liaison was the one that jumped out at me just because it seemed it seemed very different. Um, and I'm not saying that it hasn't happened before, it just seemed very different. Um, and uh, so I, I just think our report, Andy, should be robust on this element. Um, if we're not gonna take a vote on these two today, I'm ready to vote on them, but I don't feel like I have to vote on them now. I get a second chance. Michelle? Yeah, I'm, I'm personally ready to vote on this today. Um, although I hear what Lynn said about wanting to potentially hold a public hearing and I appreciate that. I think um, one of the things I think we need to be really conscious of is what the CPA guidelines say. And I don't think there's anything that precludes private properties from being included in proposals. Um, and so we can talk about philosophy as a council, but I think it's important um, that we consider what the sort of historical and present day context of the CPA fund is. Um, and I agree with what Matt said um, with respect to trusting the CPA committee um, in that they've looked at the full slate of proposals and they've balanced them um, according to the various requirements, like the 10% that Sonia spoke of, I believe it was, and just um, the, the competing demands. Um, so I would be ready to make a motion on this. I really stink at motions. I tried to write something out, <laughs> but if, um, if there isn't, um, you know, objection to doing that, I would, I think it is, I, I hear you, Kathy, about like, you can wait, but this has been on people's radar um, now for a few weeks. And we've done a quite a bit of research, I think, and had quite a bit of discussion. So from my perspective, I do believe it's time to move it forward um, to a resolution. So with that said, I could try to read the motion that I wrote or if somebody else has something else to add or, or object to that. Um. Um, well, I would say go ahead and make your motion and uh, then if uh, there's a piece that somebody thinks should be added, that could be an amendment to the motion but at least it moves us forward. Sure. Um, so again, I'm not great at motion writing, so we might need to um, amend this, but I moved to recommend the Salem Place HOA, Conkey Stevens House, and the Amherst Women's Club uh, CPA proposals to the town council for approval as part of the overall CPA recommendations with a historic preservation restriction agreement in place. Okay, I think, um, is there a second of the motion? Waiting to hear if any of the uh, council members are seconded. I'm going to second it to uh, get it um, so that we can continue to move forward because I think that the uh, there's some questions that still need to be resolved, but it moves it a little bit further. Kathy? Um, number one, can you refresh my memory? Did we already recommend the rest of the package? 
Yes, we did. Okay. So, so secondly, uh, uh, I don't think that does enough to the concerns. And just on the history of this, Michelle, we have separated out proposals from CPA before. That's one of the council's roles. We don't have to take the whole slate. We, um, in the last instance, it was around an affordable housing project and there was extensive discussion on it. So this would not be at least, I mean, the council doesn't have a long history okay, on, on doing this. That's one point. And the second point, if this wasn't a year where there was um, two million dollars more of requests, and then pared down to this limited set. So one of my concerns is we do not, we we have the ability because of Sonia's ability to figure out how to reserve it. We can make decisions not to spend all the money, and this wasn't of we had five choices and this was the best of them. Um, so I think we as a town need to be really careful and think about the pipeline and CPA as a committee, the CPAC does not have to look at a five-year timeline. You know, what's coming to them in a month, in six months, and how do they want to allocate their money? They do one year at a time. I think it would be good if they did look that way, um, the way we have to as the town on the capital side, but that is not the practice because they are one year at a time and they don't actually know the allocation. There's a good reason why they're doing that. Um, it, it has to be determined. So I don't think we're out of line in um, scrutinizing if we have questions. So I will be voting against this motion because I don't think we have to make it. Sean? Um, I guess one question I would have, and maybe this is just a zero in on the, the core issue is, do people feel the same way about the women's club project as they do the Conkey Stevens house? Because the women's club project to me seems more consistent with many other projects that have been approved in the past. Um, and so I get, and it, it's sort of been like grouped with Conkey Stevens house, maybe for some reasons, but it's, I haven't heard many, a lot of discussion about that specific project. And um, I guess the question would be, can one of them be recommended or not recommended today um, to kind of get to the core issue? So I mean, I'm just confused as the process we're following here. Um, does finance committee have that authority to to reduce the? No, it's the about whether they're going to make a. So I think what we talked about is just whether they're going to make a recommendation on these projects to the council or not. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to figure out because I know the whole council. It, the council itself can reduce the amounts, but right. not the I'm not sure if finance committee can. No. Okay. No, we, we, um, they could recommend we to make a reduction. Sure <laughs> they can, yes. Yeah, it's recommending that it's something it's not actually, um, we can't act on it ultimately. Uh, it, it, it's a recommendation of the council. Lynn? Um, if voting no means that it um, will not go forward to the council, I will be voting no. I'm not sure that ultimately I will vote no, but I really do want to hear from the rest of the council. And I do want to hear from the public. And Sonia, it is the council's final decision. Finance committee can only recommend. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to have to um, ask in a minute for Bill to reread to read the motion again. Uh, and I'll get to you in a second, Michelle. Uh, it would. I think that the key elements that I would want to see in the motion is that it, one, it's a recommendation to the council. Two, the recommendation that is in the motion is to fund the proposals as recommended by the committee, but subject to an agreement that um, a historic preservation restriction will be developed um, so, uh, subsequent to the um, grant and uh, I think that's the, probably the best that we can do because we, um, as 
Dave pointed out earlier, uh, I think it was Dave, that it takes time to get the historic preservation completed. Michelle? Yeah, I just, I want to just clarify what Lynn just offered because I'm, I guess I'm a bit confused in the sense that I, it was my understanding that this would bring it forward to the council to have this discussion and they would be aware of whatever way the vote happened and the discussion that surrounded the vote. Um, so what I heard you say is that you don't want to bring it, you do want to bring it to the council and you do want to bring it to the public, um, but you would vote no on recommending that they be included in so you're not you're not saying that you you you're not willing to vote on this, right? I'm I'm confused because it sounds to me like there are going to be there's going to be an opportunity for the council by virtue of this vote having happened today to discuss this, and then there will also be a hearing on the CPA proposals as a whole for the public to be involved in. So if you could clarify that um, before we vote, I'd appreciate it. I would like the public forum, not public hearing, public forum to include all of the all of the proposals that we've received. Um, but I have at the at the point we are right now, I will be a no vote because I am, or I could abstain either one, uh, because I really want to hear what the public has to say and the rest of the council. Got it. This has been a very, very interesting, and you never know when the next little issue in Amherst is going to arise and how. This is one of them. That's great. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Kathy? Yeah, and Michelle, the difference is the wording you had is we recommend approval as, as recommended of these, which we don't have to do at this point. We can move the package forward with a recommendation for everything but these two and leave leave it open on why these two were um, not included in the overall recommendation. We don't have the ability to not do them today. You know, the, the package is the package, um, but it's a, it's, it's a, a vote of clustering them all. And we like the whole, and most years we've just said, we like the whole slate. You know, we haven't had this discussion. You know, we, we didn't go through this. So you know, Sean asked if I feel differently about the two and the answer is yes, but I'll get a chance to vote on that at the council level. I mean, I don't put the women's club in the same category. So, but, but that's me, so. But the, I think that the motion was essentially coming back to, without the exact wording, uh, that it's recommended subject to the agreement that a historic preservation restriction will be developed on both of the properties. So, Sonia, did you have something else? Is your hand is still up? So Andy, in terms of next steps, we have to vote on the motion and then yeah. and then just I guess if, if conversation is done, are we all in agreement that the next stop is just the public forum? Um, the finance committee's reviewed it, so you know we can move forward to the public forum. Um, Sonia, you would put together, I mean the order you would put together would include all the projects, right? Because that's what was recommended by um, the CPA committee, but we would just note that only the, the two that were not recommended by finance committee at this point not that they were recommended cool. against just there was no recommendation given on those two no actually if uh, it would be recommended but with the sub subject to um, an agreement that there be yeah. added historic preservation restriction only and if this yeah if this vote passes that you got to vote take. first andy yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm just trying to clarify what the motion does. It moves them all along um, into all the recommended without restrictions. That it's recommended that the council add this restriction. 
And Sonia, is there anything that you know of in the statute that uh, would preclude the council from taking that action at the time of its vote? No, no, they can they can reduce the order by any amount with their intent. Well, it's not reducing by an amount, it's adding a provision. That's already yeah. added by the law itself. So that has to happen no matter what. So you can put it in the council order, but it's gonna happen. It's part of CPA requirements. It's so it's, so it's really not, it can be in the motion, but it's not really required is what you're saying. It's required of, it's required of the town to get a restriction for them in order for them to have the money, but it's not required to be in a motion. So in other historic preservation, um, like uh, for the UU church, there was a restriction that was placed ultimately. And most recently was the Jones mm -hmm. Library. And I don't, there wasn't any special wording about the restriction in that appropriation order, I don't believe, right, Sonia? No, we never put that part into the motions because it's part of the law, you have to do it. So it has been done in each of the cases that we're talking about, the UU, the um, JCA, Jones Library. Yes, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but yes. So then we, we really don't need anything other than the motion and the report, report of the discussion. The motion being a clean motion, just saying we recommend these two projects because it would be subject um, to the restriction anyway. So, mm -hmm. so Michelle, would you, uh, would that change how you would word the motion? Michelle, go ahead. Well, I, I guess I just want to clarify because our whole discussion last week or last meeting was around this historic preservation restriction and whether that would help us meet um, the anti-aid uh, requirements. And so I guess because we didn't have staff here maybe last time, we weren't aware that that was sort of an automatic. And what, I wanna, what I'd like to understand is, is that an automatic on all historical preservation CPA proposals? Is that, what you're, is that what you're saying? Is that it's sort of an automatic um, requirement of those proposals? Um, when I hear you say that's the law, I'm just trying to understand what you mean, Sonia, by that. Sonia or Dave, either one of you wanna? Yeah, or Dave, yeah. So that's a great question, Michelle. Um, First off, I, I don't I don't see any harm in putting this in the motion. I mean, I like the word contingent upon, you know, um, but that's a very good question, Michelle, about does every project require a historic preservation re restriction? And I guess the the correct answer to that would be no. So if we, for instance, if the town, you know, I'm thinking of projects in the past, if the town, um, the town has authorized funding for um, some materials that were owned uh, by the strong house, I believe there was some years ago, there was um, one of Emily Dickinson's dresses, I believe. Um, and so that was about four, I'm going to say $14,000. So there was really nothing to restrict. We're not going to, re, we're not going to be able to restrict the building or the, the entire strong house building or, or something of that nature in perpetuity for that. So towns do have the ability to structure what the preservation is. So so towns could do a 30 year restriction. Towns could do, there, there's some gradation there that towns are able to do. For buildings and larger projects, we, the town of Amherst, have always gone for a restriction in perpetuity. Um, so, and and even for, for instance, the uh, UU, the um, the beautiful stained glass window on the UU, 
um, we we got a, a restriction in perpetuity uh, for that project. I don't recall the number on the stained glass window, but I want to say Ben might be able to help me or Chris. I want to say it was $150,000 or $200,000. I don't recall the exact number, um, but uh, we got a, a restriction in perpetuity on that. But for smaller historic preservation projects, we would not necessarily get a restriction in perpetuity. Um, so I don't see any reason why it can't be in the motion if if that is clearer and more transparent. So Bill, uh, how could, do you have the motion down? Well, I have slightly tweaked what Michelle said based on what you said. So what I have is uh, that Miller moved and Steinberg seconded to recommend that the Conkey Stevens House and the Amherst, to recommend the Conkey Stevens House and the Amherst Women's Club to the town council for approval as part of the CPA's recommendation, subject to having a historic preservation restriction agreement in place on both properties. Michelle, is, do you feel comfortable with that wording? I do, yes. And I do too. So that's the motion that's then on, um, before us. And uh, maybe it's time for us to move towards a, uh, a vote and uh, statements from resident members as to whether they support the motion as worded. So seeing no other hands going up, I am gonna proceed in that. Um, and uh, we'll go alphabetically. Um, so start with Lynn. I vote no. Uh, Bob, what's your opinion? You're muted, Bob. Uh, sorry, I have to recuse myself again because of the, the conflict I mentioned previously. Okay, uh, Matt? I support it. Uh, Bernie? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with motion. Um, Michelle? I vote yes. Kathy? No. And I'm voting yes. Uh, and Alicia? Um, I just want to confirm I, I'm voting no, but that, that means just that I'm not recommending it to the council. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the motion fails. Because there was a vote of the council members voted three no, two yes. And uh, we had uh, on the uh, one supporting from the resident members, one recusal. And uh, Bernie, I'm not sure how to. He said no. Yeah, you, you were recommending against. So we had one, one, one recusal. So at this point, um, Lynn, you have an, your hand is up. Uh, I want to just suggest two things. Uh, first of all, that given the nature of how to reflect this, uh, and the fact that the hearing, or the, excuse me, now I'm saying hearing, the public forum is not until the 21st. If you wanna make sure, Andy, that you have time to write the report and get feedback uh, from the committee, you could wait to file the report on this until then. But the other thing I just wanna mention is we have a hearing on the 10th uh, regarding the parking permits, and we're supposed to have a finance recommendation um, coming from here, or at least thoughts, if you will, to TSO for that meeting on the 10th, which is a committee of the whole, and it is already 11 o'clock. So I don't know how we want to handle this. Yeah. Um, 
I think that we're going to have to end the discussion today um, without in what we're going to end up doing is exactly what uh, is Linda suggested that I will do a draft um, and say that we have not made a recommendation at this point on two proposals and um, this is the background why and um, try and summarize the discussion and uh, so we can move to the last uh, item and see who's, uh, if anybody is not able to stay with the committee long enough to have a discussion on the transportation issue. Um, real quick, Dave and then Kathy, so we can move on. I was just gonna say, I'm ready to move to the transportation. I have specific, um, I, I read the memo from Sean, but I have specific recommended changes in what was recommended that I'd like to discuss. So. Sure, and Andy, really quickly, and, and I'm sure staff, um, I just wanted to take away, just so we could talk about it as staff, um, just so we understand if the proposal for the Conkey House, if the Conkey House were a private residence and they had applied for funding, I'm just curious, would, would the concerns still be the same? Um, they would, okay, because, so our takeaway, we're, we're gonna do a little conversation, you know, with, with Chris and Ben, because that is, um, that is kind of a more significant, um, um, you know, uh, broader concern than, than I thought here, because clearly, I mean, across the, across the Commonwealth municipalities have, have invested in private homes and historic homes all across the Commonwealth. So, um, uh, it sends kind of, it may send kind of a chilling message to to try to preserve historic structures in our in our community that are that are privately owned. So, if that's the you know the the concern that is being expressed here, you know we we can kind of look at that as a as a staff. So I just wanted to clarify that. I appreciate your input on that. So thanks. I'm not sure that we can say that the committee has a position on it because we didn't really uh, have it as a separate discussion. I think we were focusing more on the historic preservation question in the vote. Okay, I saw some heads nodding yes, so I apologize. I didn't mean to take that as a, as a group. I agree. I agree I think, with Andy. I, I think it's premature to spend staff time on that issue yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that it, at this point, that issue will end up being reported to the council and uh, then the council will give guidance on the issue uh, after the public forum. But I don't think we're there yet as a committee okay. because we haven't taken, we didn't take a specific vote on that issue. Chris? Thank you. Just wanted to say that that um, point of view, um, in my understanding, um, runs counter to the point of view of the CPA committee. And I think that the CPA committee has recently felt that um, some of the historic preservation money should be um, distributed to um, private properties. And so it may be worthwhile at some point to have um, either all of this group or some of this group meet with the CPA committee to try to understand their point of view. And then that would inform your point of view. Um, because right now you're talking, you're sort of in silos talking and coming together and talking about this may be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, that's very helpful. And I think that uh, what was, appropriate now is that I have a conversation with Sarah and uh, with Lynn and to find figure out how we want to get the CPA committee involved in the public forum and council discussion. Kathy? Uh, I would just 
And as part of that, Andy, we've gotten some very good answers, legal answers on what else can be done. So it's not like never fun, but we asked about loans. We asked about, you know, a payment back. So we got information as part of this that would be good in that discussion with CPA to be sharing it. So there's not a reinvention of, of that. So just um, most of that was given to us verbally, but I'm sure Sean has it all written up too. So that was... Uh, I just, w this was, staff did a lot of work for us to get information back to us that I found very useful. And I, we all appreciate that very much and thank all of the staff. Michelle? I just want to push back a little bit because I, I think that what Dave said actually um, does have some accuracy to it in terms of what this discussion meant today. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not, saying that it's ready to go to staff to you know say that the in fact i personally wouldn't want i i think we I, I think we're divided here essentially is what i'm saying on our philosophy around this um but i think it does sound to me that there are some members of this committee that do feel um that supporting private properties through cpa funding is not appropriate and that there are other members who feel, or at least I will speak for myself, that I feel that that, as Dave said, is being done um, throughout uh, the state of Massachusetts and is sort of like part of what CPA does. And so I'm just wondering like where the, sort of what's being activated, particularly in Lynn and Kathy around this, um, that feels so uncomfortable um, given what the guidelines are um, of the CPA as it stands. And that doesn't have to be answered now. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, no, I think that's helpful. And I think that that's uh, what I was thinking should be part of the report and why I wanted to take time with the report is to make sure that the fact that that discussion has taken place and has, the issue has not been resolved within the committee gets before the council. Uh, so I think we'll, the wording of the report will get there. Um, does anybody need to leave immediately because we really do need to um, get to the transportation issue and I wanna hear the call on Kathy to start that conversation since she seems to be uh, wanting to propose something other than what was specifically recommended. So seeing no hands go up about my question as to whether there's, uh, Chris? So Andy, you don't need Ben and, and me anymore to discuss this transportation issue, right? No, I, I don't think you were involved in the transportation right. discussion. Okay, thank I, you. Thank, I thank both of you. You've been very helpful. It's really, um, you know, you've been a great resource in, in a difficult conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um, Kathy? I'm going to keep this moving, so... So um, some of my comments, recommendations of changes build off conversation we had last time, um, even though it was pretty short. Um, I, I get, I don't know how best to frame it. I mean, probably if Sean can put up what was recommended in fees, I have, I, I like a lot of the framing that was done and I have more of, um, how high we would go and how quickly we would go. And then there were a couple other issues uh, Alicia raised on affordability about fees. So I'll just go, th I'll go through my specific list and then we can map them. I like, the, I think talking about the permit fees is in two categories with one, uh, you are a resident downtown and you have registered your car in Amherst. So to me, that is a person who's probably a longer term resident. The other residents who didn't register their car 
didn't bother to because they're not planning on living here forever. So on on the, the I like that split. I see no reason not to go up the, the resident without uh, Amherst registration. I would go up right away. I wouldn't phase it. Um, and I asked Sean and he got us information about what does it cost to buy a permit to park at the New York at UMass uh, parking lots and 400 is about the right number. So I would go up quickly on it because I see I, I would enrich the goals of what we're trying to do here. We're doing it for revenue so we can do some infrastructure. I think we want to limit parking downtown if people have an alternative place to park their car. And so we shouldn't be providing a financial incentive that we're the cheaper place to park. So for the non Amherst vehicle registrations, I would phase it in quickly as in next year. Um, and the thing about these is these are turnovers. So it's not hitting someone who's been here forever. Um, for the resident with Amherst vehicle registration, um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure why we need to phase it over three years rather than two. And I, I don't know how difficult it would be, but we have seniors living downtown in senior housing. If we said we would, would give them a different rate and we would give with the new units being built, there be some affordable housing downtown. If you're living in a designated affordable housing unit, could we do that and have a two tier for a resident with an Amherst vehicle, with Amherst registration, who lives downtown. And Sean's distribution on this, we don't have that many. And I think a lot of them may be living in the senior housing. Um, so trying to worry about that. So, so I had those two. So could we do a tier within resident with vehicle registration that gave seniors and low income, meaning people who are living in affordable housing to the extent we have it downtown? And go up faster on non because we don't we don't they always could have the opportunity to register their car and then we would get an excise tax on their car so that would be revenue for us then i my last point is on the lower level garage um my observation of this is we're giving a year-round 24 7 opportunity to park your car in a protected garage and the spaces are often empty on nights and weekends, at the, exactly at the time when people are circling around town if there's a big event and can't find a parking place. And sometimes it's as many as half of them are empty and you can't park. So I'm wondering if there are, Sean's given us the information, there are 28 of these, um, and you can apparently have up to three cars, so three different license plates could be in one of these reserved spots. So I'm wondering if we could do a differential that half of them become 24 seven if we don't wanna eliminate it altogether. And the others get, you get this only from nine or from eight until five or whatever the meters, the meters in the garage go up to free it up at nighttime and to free it up on the weekends or to free it up on holidays because it's, it's good space to park if you're coming to a downtown meeting. And I feel like we're giving away space. And I understand it's solid revenue that there's interest in keeping up the stream that people do seem to renew. Um, Sean's got us information that about 70% or so are renewals, you know, so this is not, so you can kind of keep your permanent parking place. And it seems to be some are employees downtown. So those were, those were my three main areas, and my goals were get more money from the permit increase, uh, discourage parking with a permit downtown if you have another place to park. So that's the go up faster if you're out of thing, um, and uh, not hurt people who are living on restricted income. So that those were my three pieces in reaction to what was proposed to us. I guess that I would have some questions to go out to either you and to the group as a whole. One is one that Sean has raised before, which is um, going up um, too quickly. Does, does that run the risk of um, 
people making a choice not to park and then it runs counter to the goal of uh, generating revenue for the enterprise fund uh, because people are going to choose not to park not uh, to go to the university for leave their car there as opposed to downtown and then we lose the revenue for the enterprise fund so that's one question and the other is on this particularly in the downtown garage question those spaces that are just not permanently rented um, does it create enforcement problems because does it put the town in the position of having to heavily regulate um, early in the morning or whenever the time um, for the that it's a reserved space that somebody's paid a lot of money for? Do we have to get towing done at that time? And uh, do we want to go that route? Well, I'll just a quick response, but then I'm interested, you know, for I wasn't going to change his uh, resident permit with Amherst vehicle. Um, I think the the original idea of building, uh, doing the no, the buildings downtown that didn't have to provide parking, the argument was people wouldn't have cars. Um, and now we've got a, an issue of there are too many cars parking downtown and people can't always find parking places. So I think that if you have a car, you need to park it someplace. So Sean came up with these numbers. I'm not quibbling with the 150, 300 and 400. I would just go up faster, um, get to that 400 by either by year one or by year two, um, because it because of the number of permits, Andy, if even half of them continue to buy a permit, it is a lot of money for the enterprise fund compared to $25. That's all they're paying now. So it's a lot of money. And he gave us numbers. That we're, we're giving a lot of permits to park on our streets. And I think Bob raised that a few of these permit signs might be better to have a meter in them to allow short-term people to, you know, people coming and going. So we may have too many park with the permit signs and one might have a few more with uh, the old, put your money in the meter and pay to park. So um, I don't think what I've said would end up with a shortfall it, uh, because the calculation was based on how many people have permits. So that's, that's it. And, you know, and I wasn't going to go up that higher on the resident permit with Amherst vehicle. I just was saying, if we go up, can we protect? It was Alicia's question last time. Is there a way of protecting people from a big jump up if they're living on restricted income? So could we do two tiers in that? We have a second tier already for employees. They're in another group. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be quick. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I actually agree with the non Amherst vehicle registration, um, maybe starting a little higher to begin with and maybe moving up slightly faster. Uh, I think what you want to basically do, because your competitor here is the university. However, I want to point out the university is out of parking spaces. So the reality is we aren't competing against them because they don't have anything to compete with. So I don't think on the non-resident one, we're in a lot of danger of losing a lot. I also want to be very sensitive to not just low income people, but low wage earners. Yep. And, and just, you know, I'm, if I'm earning $15 an hour in a waitress position, if I'm lucky, um, I just want to be sensitive somehow to that, but that's really the employee employer um, permit. And I think we are being somewhat sensitive there uh, and regarding the lower level in Boltwood, I think several people have made the point that they go down there, they see these empty reserve spaces and they go, well, then either they're empty and people should pay a lot more for them, or we should figure out how to free some up part of the time. So 
I like the fact that Kathy has asked these questions. And Sean, I want to thank you yet again for your amazing responses to all of us. Thanks. Mostly Jen, just for the record. Mostly Jen. <laughs> so. Jen, thank you. <laughs> uh, Bob? Yeah, I, I, I do want to echo uh, what I had said before and what Kathy had suggested is that we should push the the, the uh, resident non-Amherst registration up um, more quickly um, because I, I agree that um, there's no reason not to. <laughs> um, with In terms of the, the lower level of uh, Boltwood, um, I'm sort of torn a little bit. One is that the town is offering these spaces to people to park at will. And if a car's there or a car's not there, we're still getting the revenue from that space. So I think if we're setting spaces aside that people who have the means or whatever can pay for them, what difference does it make if there's a car there? Um, I know it, it. optically it's not very nice, uh, especially if you're driving around looking for a space. But if we wanna do that, then I think we just have to accept the fact that People are not always going to have a car there. Um, the other, another alternative would be to take some of those spaces and move them from downstairs in the garage to upstairs in the garage, um, you know, so that people would have to clean their car off in the snow. Maybe they'd be less expensive spaces. But I think there's ways we can do that without just sort of eliminating 28 of them or 10 of them or whatever. I think we can do something in between. Thanks. Um, let's see who's next on the list. And Michelle? Muted. Um, for as long as I can remember, um, the, the numbers that Sean gave us, this 28 in the Boltwood lot, uh, that's been reflected in my observations. Um, and so I'm wondering if it makes sense just to reevaluate how many reserved spaces we're talking about here, as opposed to having um, sort of time constraints that Kathy suggested, because I think the towing situation would become real, like how do we actually enforce it? And it could get messy. So maybe it's just that we take 10 of those reserves, if we don't need them, if we're historically showing that we're only filling, uh, you know, 30 of them, then maybe um, we just remove five or 10 of them and open them up just for um, regular meters or something along that line. Sean? Yeah, thank you. So a few things. I think with the lower level Boltwood garage, um, you know, I would be concerned about rem reducing. I think we've actually been looking at increasing and um, looking at our lots that are underutilized elsewhere and seeing if we could put reserve spots there to, again, bring in more revenue. Um, we know we have some lots like Prey Street and, and the, the lot behind CVS. Sometimes that just aren't, people don't know about them, they're underutilized. Um, and those might be good locations to add reserve parking, which um, up until this point has brought in more, you know, those 28 spots bring in more revenue than all the other permit parking in town. <laughs> so, you know, the other three, 300, 400, whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm just thinking personally for myself, like when I, if I'm going to spend $1,500 for a spot, you want a spot. Um, I know they might not be there, but there's, you know, no one's in their parking spot 24 seven. Um, I don't, I think we would have to dramatically reduce the price or adjust the price if it was going to be, if there were going to be qualifications on when you could park there. Um, I mean, we could survey those permit holders to find out, but I'm guessing like knowing there's a spot there is, is you know, the value for that. Um, I think in terms of the how quickly we raise the prices, that's definitely something that TSO has talked about um, quite a bit. I think you know our intent with the transition plan again was to allow us to evaluate each year um, how these price increases impact the number of permit holders we have. Um, now that we, especially now that we have the open gov system where we can get much more data. So I mean, we're, I don't think we're against going up quicker. I, I think, but our, but our intent was to kind of do this over time so we could we could evaluate. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say is, and I think this is where TSO is too, is I think we want to hear from the people now before we make. Um, I, I know from Ross, it's like, oh, that's not so expensive, but we haven't heard from the permit holders or um, the public at large, and, and even to the point about um, you know adjustments for seniors. 
I think we should see if that comes out at the, the public forum. Um, we sent, we have sent the notice of the public forum to every permit holder that we have. So everyone, you know, that currently has a permit that will be affected by this has that information. Um, and we're hoping that there's a good turnout at that forum to let us know what they think. Thank you, Bernie. Um, just real quick, I, I would agree with that the Boltwood garage situation should be kept simple. Um, you, you get a, you, you buy a spot for a year, it's your spot. That's it. Let's not try to slice and dice and create enforcement difficulties. Uh, I would also uh, encourage uh, an increase, a more rapid increase. Um, in the, and I understand the need to stage it, but I would encourage a more rapid increase in the rates. And the other thing is the, uh, the term eligible elderly needs to have a definition. Um, otherwise, you're giving me a discount. Yeah, the, the uh, problem with um, anything that we do to condition it that's not, uh, the more complicated you make the condition, the harder it is on staff to implement it and the more intrusive it is to ask the questions in order to implement it. Andy, I just wanted to quickly say, I have a hard stop at 1130. Um, yeah. Jen may be able to stay, I'm not sure, but um, I just I have another meeting at that time. Okay, um, well, I wanna move this along and get it done. So should we just report to TSO the discussion without re a specific recommendation and uh, suggest that uh, we're as interested in the forum as um, they will be and uh, who would like would appreciate the opportunity to um, continue this discussion after the forum. You know, it, and I, I think it, that makes sense, Andy, and that the sense of the committee was to go up faster on the resident without a Amherst plate. Um, you know, but but that we're not voting on it, but just when we were looking at it, because I, I think the framework that Sean set up is a very good one. We haven't had that differentiation before. I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I, I might also add that I, I think the committee has a consensus that we need to increase parking fees. Right. <laughs> right. So I yes. don't think I yeah. don't think that that I think that's an important thing to message to carry you know, right. for, carry forward. Okay, um, I'll do my best. Um, so going back to um, then, is there anything further to be said on the transportation recommendations at this time that we're not gonna take a position, but we are going to do a report and I think we have a context of what the report will be. Is anybody uncomfortable with that? is the resolution for today. And I think that report needs to be ready for Monday if possible. Yeah, we may have to uh, bifurcate the report and get that one moving. Thanks, Andy. But, uh, I think more so. quickly um, than the uh, other one, because if we try and do them both together, that'll take longer. So I'll, I'll approach it in that way. Uh, Anything else to be said on transportation? And I guess the um, I have one thing I need to do, is, uh, we have no public, so I don't have to do public comment at this point. I think there was one person earlier and um, who's not there now. Um, the approval of minutes. Um, the I had some, um, some changes that I would uh, make. They're not major, they're more wording kinds of things. I don't have the uh, bandwidth right now, given the time constraint to pull up my notes and actually read them to you. Um, but they're, uh, they really are not uh, anything more than uh, clarity of wording uh, types of things. So, um, um, 
Can I move that we um, leave the approval of these minutes to Andy uh, based on slight wording changes? I would second that. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion on the motion further? Otherwise, I'm going to quickly run through the uh, vote and just um, so we can be done. And uh, uh, with uh, Bob Hegner. Uh, you see your support, Matt. You, Matt Halloran. Right. Um, Bernie. Supported. Uh, Michelle. What? Well, you're a yes because yes. Uh, Kathy. Yes. I'll vote yes. Alicia. Yes. Lynn. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll do that in a minute. So I'll send you um, to show you what the corrections were as well as the clean version. I can do that one pretty quickly. Um, so, um, our next meeting for it, um, but I don't have my note in front of me. Kathy, do you remember what we, you, we you actually, with? you actually tabled it, Andy, because <laughs> we, we got to agree that March 1st would be a date. And then we didn't say whether we're meeting again on the 15th. You had originally had, uh, I think, the 22nd. Yeah. yeah. So is there anybody who cannot meet on March 15th? I, um, I'm, I, I could be available if needed, but I would prefer not to meet that day if possible. I'm traveling to visit family. I also don't think I'd be available for the full um, duration of the meeting. Mm. I, I cannot meet on the 15th for, for what it's worth. Yeah, I remember you had said that there was a problem that you had with the date. Um, Can, did we decide that we couldn't yeah. do the 22nd? So I, I, was, problem with the well, I, I have I have an eye doctor. It's an eye doctor appointment, which took me four months to get. Um, so I won't join you um, because it's uh, I'm not going to be out of there till like quarter of ten in the morning. So I would come late. I could come back for I could be joining for the second half. Since, okay. since I'll just so carry my iPad with me to the doctor's office. <laughs> okay. So here's what I'm going to do, uh, just to get this moving along, and that is, um, I'll send out a poll for some other dates, and uh, we'll uh, meet on the 22nd as the default if we can't find another date through that method. Yeah, and Andy, well, I don't know what, I hate to screw people's schedules up, but if it didn't start till 930, I probably can make the whole meeting on the, most of the meeting on the 22nd. So, you know, it's just what you do when. Um, so I just, it's it's an 830 in the morning. It's over in Northampton, but in any case, so I'm not, the whole morning's not gone for me, but just it's an overlap. So I don't want to be the one that it seemed like that date works for everyone. So I don't know whether a nine. Okay, well, before we do that then, thank you. That's helpful. So let's let's do it on the 22nd and I will consult you about the agenda order. Okay. And and, and we'll meet at nine. If, if, meet if, at if, nine. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and, I, and you'll just know I'm joining you late. So um, do, do whatever Kathy doesn't care about at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I'll I want to thank you, Kathy. <laughs> I want to thank everybody because this has been a really valuable uh, meeting. We've covered a lot of territory and a lot of good discussion, but uh, it, um, it it took longer than we had wanted. Um, I have nothing further. Uh, it was. Um,
business not anticipated. Uh, at least nothing that I can't put in the memo later. So I, uh, I think for discussion today, if nobody else has anything to add, I think that we can declare ourselves adjourned. Bye, everyone. Good meeting. Thank you. It was a good meeting.